Chapter 22, Remote Sniping. The Genesis of Remote Sniping. The Periscope Trench Rifle. The need for remote sniping capability was recognized as far back as World War I. During the Great War, deadly German snipers working from the cover of their muddy trench systems made daily life in the Allied trenches hazardous. Even if an Allied sniper carefully poked their rifle and part of their head over the parapet of their dugouts to observe the German lines, they still ran the risk of taking a bullet in the face from a waiting German marksman. No matter what the Allied snipers did, they still had to expose themselves to some degree just to look down the sights of their weapon. What was the answer to this problem? Where the very act of aiming your rifle was a death sentence. As early as 1915, Allied troops developed a system to protect themselves from the always scanning German snipers. This invention was the periscope rifle. Specifically, one Sergeant William Beach, an Australian soldier who fought in the gruesome trenches of Gallipoli, developed a version of the periscope rifle. In the same year, the French also created a version of the periscope rifle. There were different models of the periscope rifle, but they all had the same basic design, which included a frame to hold a rifle above the trenches, a periscope so the shooter could remain in the trenches, but still look over the rifle's sights through the periscope's mirrors, and a method of remotely pulling the rifle's trigger. Some historians credit two Americans with developing the periscope rifle, although it is more accurate to say they developed a version of the periscope rifle. Even though the United States did not enter World War I until 1917, many Americans believed they would eventually be dragged into the horrible conflict, and some were actively preparing for such an eventuality. Such men included James L. Cameron and Lawrence E. Yagi, two avid riflemen from Ohio. They were following the events of the Great War and understood what a deadly menace enemy snipers presented. Their answer to this problem was the periscope rifle. The two created a metal frame a rifle sat in, there was a periscope attached to it, and levers for working the bolt action of the rifle and the trigger. With this system, the rifle and frame sat on the shoulders of the shooter above their head so the weapon could be fired without any exposure to the enemy. Once they had a working model of their invention, they traveled across the Atlantic in order to present their design to the British and French soldiers locked in combat with the Germans. At the time, the Allied response to the German sniper threat was to observe the enemy lines with traditional box periscopes. Once they had a target, they would put down the periscope, pick up their rifle, and take their shot. However, the Germans recognized this tactic and could see the sun glint off the box periscopes. In response, the German shooters patiently waited for the Allied sharpshooters to stick their head over the trench with their rifle and then promptly shot them. The two inventors took advice from these combat veterans and further refined their system. Following guidance from the United States Ordnance Department, the two inventors had to create a device that did not require any significant or permanent alterations to the standard U.S. service rifle, the Springfield M1903 bolt-action rifle. In the end, Cameron and Yagi produced a lightweight metal frame weighing only 6 pounds. The weight of the frame was actually advantageous since it dampened the recoil of the rifle and made follow-on shots easier. The most important piece of the entire design was the periscope sight, which was called a cytoscope. The cytoscope was a stable device as it was securely attached by screws to the left side of the rifle stock. Different from the earlier French and Australian designs, the cytoscope was its own aiming device and did not require a shooter to look over the rifle sights. It was an independent scope. During testing, the system was able to fire 10 bullets in a 1.3 inch group at 200 yards. Importantly, after hearing from the French and British veterans, the visible lenses of the cytoscope were recessed so light would not reflect off them. While the system performed admirably during America's short experience in the war, as soon as the conflict ended, interest for the Cameron Yagi design quickly disappeared and the invasion or the invention was all but forgotten. 
the need for remote sniping in World War II. The need for a remote sniping capability was very real in the trench warfare of the Great War, but as so is often the case, a weapon important in wartime suddenly loses its appeal in peacetime. By the time World War II came in the fall of 1939, the ghosts of World War I were laid to rest. This new war was one of movement, of slashing panzer formations, screaming dive bombers, and mobile artillery. The paradigm of World War I, where the world's great nations bled themselves white in the god-awful trenches, was discarded as a failed model. Discarded along the, with the idea of static, attrition warfare, was the trench periscope rifle. Plus, World War II began a full 20 years after the Great War ended. There were probably few soldiers left in the militaries uh, of the participating countries who even remembered what a trench periscope rifle was. They were not fighting a trench war anyways, so who cared? It was in the fall of 1942 when the Germans' doomed 6th Army was trapped in the blood-soaked streets of Stalingrad that the German army wished they developed the trench periscope rifle into a modern, usable weapon system. During the ferocious urban warfare and the bombed-out ruins of Stalin's city, the German army realized they needed the ability to fire around corners and without being seen. As it was, whenever a German soldier peered around a corner with their weapon, they were met with a hail of gunfire or fell victim to an invisible Russian sniper concealed somewhere in the maze of rubbled buildings. A few Russian soldiers, who were also fighting for their lives in Stalingrad and suffering tremendous casualties, also realized they needed the ability to fire their weapons at the Germans while remaining concealed. Vasily Zaitsev mentioned in his book, Notes of a Sniper, that he met a Russian infantryman who rigged several PPSH-41 submachine guns to fire remotely when the Germans assaulted the building he was defending. Vasily described exactly what the hard-pressed soldier devised in order to defend the metalworking factory. Inside the boiler room were six of our Tommy gunners and one machine gunner, the sailor Plaskin. Since their group was cut off from our battalion, they had turned the boiler room into a fortress, from which they had been able to repel one German attack after another. Misha and I were amazed by their cunning and ingenuity. They had taken several of their Tommy guns and aimed their barrels through breaches in the wall. The Tommy guns had been bracketed into place by twisted pieces of water pipe. They had run wires from the triggers back to Plaskin, who at this stage was the only soldier left with injuries minor enough to be able to fire anything. I asked Plaskin how it worked, and he demonstrated by jerking on the wires. The Germans did not know it, but they already had an ideal weapon for remote sniping in the pockmarked wasteland of Stalingrad, their excellent general-purpose machine gun, the MG-34. The MG-34 could be fired single shot like a regular rifle, and both the Germans and Allies used machine guns for single shot sniping during the trench warfare of World War I, but by the time of Stalingrad, these techniques were forgotten. German MG-34 Medium Machine Gun The MG-34 came with a scope so the weapon could be precisely aimed and with an excellent tripod that was standard issue to all German MG-34 teams. Consequently, any German MG-34 team could aim their machine gun at a specific target, like a doorway, window, or bunker, and left the weapon sitting on its tripod. They could have connected a wire to the trigger like the Russians did and moved a couple meters away from their remote sniping system, staying hidden in a bunker or building. When a Russian appeared in their sights, they could remotely pull the trigger, all while remaining safe from the Russians' own sniper teams. While a few individual machine gun teams may have cracked the code on remote sniping, it never became formal instruction at the German infantry schools. While the German infantry could have jury-rigged their MG-34s into remote sniping platforms, the German military did create a remote-controlled MG-34 towards the end of the war called the Rundumsfuhrer Remote Control Mount. However, this remote machine gun was mounted on armored vehicles like the Sturmgeschutz and Hetzer tank destroyers. It was designed to be controlled from inside the safety of the vehicle so the crew could fire the machine gun in urban environments and against enemy anti-tank teams. 
The Rundum Sphere was a relatively simple design and allowed the operator to remotely fire their MG-34 on single shot as a sniper weapon. The Krummerlauf Bent Barrel By the fall of 1943, after the 6th Army's resounding defeat in Stalingrad, the German military requested a weapon be designed that could fire around corners. As fate would have it, a German officer by the name of Colonel Hans Joachim Scheid was already working on such a device, except it was being designed to help armor crews defend themselves from enemy anti-tank teams. Shade was designing a bent-barreled weapon specifically for the German assault guns, the Sturmgeschütz, which suffered from not having a bow-mounted machine gun and were thus extremely vulnerable from enemy anti-tank teams during street fighting in Russia. After fabricating a workable design, Shade received approval from de Fuhrer in December 1943 to move forward with his Krummerlauf, or bent barrel. With official backing from Hitler himself, the device went into full production. However, the Krummerlauf suffered from excessive recoil and was best when fired from an armored vehicle in order to stabilize it. An initial production, often 1,000 units, went forward in August 1944 and soon saw service in combat. The German panzer crews, who had to fight off determined Rush tanki- Russian tank hunting teams, had great praise for the Krummerlauf design, which ensured the bent barrel weapons would see continued use. While the vehicle mounted model proved successful, Shade was determined to design a bent barrel for infantry use. His idea was to create a barrel with a lesser bend of only 30 degrees. He eventually designed a model that was 11 inches long, 0.787 inches in diameter, and rifled. This infantry model could also be used as a grenade launcher if so desired. However, firing around a corner was not enough. The German soldier had to aim and accurately hit a target. Consequently, Shade went to the famed Zeiss optical firm and requested their assistance in producing a prismatic visor slash sight with a set of mirrors positioned near the muzzle so soldiers could see a target, aim through the sight, and accurately engage the enemy. Because the infantry version was only bent 30 degrees, it had manageable recoil. The final infantry version was successfully completed and began production in early 1945. The Krummerlauf did not change the outcome of the Germans losing war, but it was an important leap forward in the evolution of remote firing weapons designed for urban combat. During the fighting on the Western Front, American forces captured many of these Krummerlauf systems. These captured systems were sent to the U.S. Army's Ordnance Corps, where they were studied and their performance analyzed. Captain Philip B. Sharp of the U.S. Army Ordnance Corps tested the 90-degree models designed for use in armored vehicles and noted, Over two-thirds of the bullet were torn into two or three pieces, but at very short range it would have been deadly. This was because the bullets fired through the barrel bent at 90 degrees suffered from yaw, tumbling off their axis, and thus becoming unstable. Sharp noted the recoil on these 90-degree models was severe and simply impractical for infantry soldiers to use. However, he made the observation when fired from a tank as designed, the the Krummerlauf shot excellently. Then, Sharp tested the 30-degree model, which the Germans intended to equip their machine pistol-armed infantrymen with. Captain Sharp saw the infantry model, Shot perfectly at 100 meters, this author could place four out of five shots in a letterhead-sized target. Had these Krummerlauf devices ever gotten into full production and distribution, they would have cost us many thousands of casualties. As with the trench periscope rifle of World War I, the Krummerlauf was quickly forgotten. The German, Russian, and American militaries, who all had first-hand experience with these innovative weapon systems, discarded the Krummerlauf as an exotic piece of equipment, which had a limited application at best. It would be exactly 60 years from the Krummerlauf's birth when a modern, more sophisticated version of the bent barrel came to light. This new device was called simply the Corner Shot and was created by Israeli soldiers who discovered the need for such a weapon after decades of urban guerrilla warfare against Hezbollah, 
the PLO, and Hamas. Ironically, it was the survivors of Hitler's Holocaust who perfected the original German design and created a weapon system heralded by many as the major evolution in dismounted urban warfare and close quarters battle. What was born in the streets of Stalingrad and died in the smoking ruins of Berlin was resurrected in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The Corner Shot In December 2003, the Corner Shot was officially released, the result of five years of product development and a cost of $2 million. The Corner Shot is similar to its father, the Krummerlauf, but with some important distinctions. First, the system is designed to accept a variety of pistols that are inserted into a synthetic, lightweight frame. The frame is hinged, so when the corner shot is fired around a corner, the pistol itself is placed around the corner. Unlike the Krummerlauf, there is no bent barrel, as the entire weapon moves on the hinged frame. Also, the corner shot uses a small camera, which is attached to the frame and connected to a small LCD screen that enables the shooter to see what their pistol sees, all without exposing themselves to enemy fire. The corner shot also comes in versions that can fire assault rifles and grenade launchers. A former Israeli soldier involved in the corner shot's design had high praise for the system. I believe that the corner shot weapon system can be extremely beneficial in the global war on terror. It protects soldiers' lives and increases their chances of survival while drastically improving their ability to gather information and transmit the combat scenario as well as pinpoint and engage targets out of their line of sight. Today's combatant situations, especially in low-intensity conflicts, involve fighting in urban terrain and inside inhabited buildings, forced entry into airplanes, buses, or trains. This unnecessarily exposes security forces to the enemy and presents an immediate risk to their lives. Corner shot removes the need for this initial exposure. One of Corner Shot's creators, Asaf Nadel, a veteran of Israeli's military, agrees with the importance of such weapon systems in urban combat. Quote, the Corner Shot system is designed in a way that enables security forces to engage targets from the left and right, from the front, up, or down, and to move to each of these shooting positions very rapidly without the removal of hands from the weapon. This shortens reaction time and increases accuracy in sudden engagement situations. The weapon system can be triggered completely from behind cover. End quote. Urban sniping implications. The use of remote sniper systems like the trench periscope rifle, Krummerlauf, and corner shot give the urban sniper a lot of options. A benefit of using such a device is it reduces a sniper's physical profile. When using one of these devices, the sniper does not expose their head, their face, or any other part of their body when making a shot. As long as the shooter stays behind cover, they do not even have to camouflage themselves. All they have to do is camouflage their weapon, which is a much easier task. Consequently, enemy forces will have a difficult time observing the sniper and their unobtrusive weapon. Even more important for the sniper is their newfound immunity to counter sniper efforts. The best an opposing counter-sniper team could do against a weapon like the corner shot is to shoot the weapon itself, which is a very small object, but the shooter has nothing to fear. Because the shooter is protected by remaining behind cover, like the corner of a building, a sniper can aim their weapon at a target while under direct fire from opposing counter-sniper teams and still make their shot undisturbed. Opposing counter-sniper teams armed with high-powered rifles are a nuisance at best. Let us compare the three designs and see how they measure up. The grandfather of remote sniping, the original Trent Periscope rifle, is still a valid concept. Gun enthusiasts have made modern reproductions of the original design. All the necessary materials are already available and cheap, and have proven they can hit man-sized targets at 300 meters and beyond but the system's limitations have to be taken into consideration. The trench periscope frame is bulky, not very concealable, and accuracy suffers at distance. A shooter firing the same rifle the conventional way without the trench periscope frame can hit targets at two to three times the distance because the weapon is more stable, easier to control, and the shooter has a better sight picture when they look through their periscope with the naked eye. 
of it should, should be looked through their scope with the naked eye. However, if the shooter is in an urban environment with close ranges, the system works fine. The Krummerlauf design does not have to die either, as a gunsmith could engineer a similar one. We can guess a modern version Krummerlauf would only be good for close range, 100 meters or less, because of the inherent limitations of firing a bullet through a curved barrel. Any bullet propelled at high velocities through other than a straight barrel suffers from bullet instability and yaw. On the positive side, a Krummerlauf device is small, may only weigh a pound or two, and is therefore concealable. The corner shot is by far the dev device of choice among the three. The sighting mechanism, which is used in conjunction with the LCD screen on the corner shot, is far superior to the other two, making sight alignment and a good sight picture easier to attain. Also, since the corner shot frame mimics a traditional rifle with its shoulder stock, the shooter can hold the weapon more securely and make at more accurate shots at distance. Accuracy will still suffer because there is some slop in the weapon that is created between the weapon and the corner shot frame itself. A shooter will still get a better sight picture and sight alignment if they can sight their weapon with the naked eye. And one must always consider price and availability. The average person is unable to afford the corner shot that is priced at up to $5,000 a model. Plus, it is a controlled item and not easy to get a hold of. In contrast, an old-school trench periscope can be built in a day in your garage and costs almost nothing.